Hi, my name is Curtis, and I get the privilege of serving as the executive pastor here at The Life Church. Here at TLC, we exist to impact culture through the innovative presentation of Christianity, and we want to inspire people to live a better life. We are so excited that you decided to tune in wherever you're watching from. And if you haven't already, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. We believe that God has a word just for you. So get your notes ready, and let's jump in to today's incredible message. Today, y'all, we are starting a brand new series called Missed Calls. Somebody say Missed Calls, Missed Calls, Missed Calls. Some of you are instantly convicted because you ignored somebody's phone call this week in this room, and then you bumped into them in the foyer. Amen. God, be glorified. You have that awkward, you know, in the grocery store, you have that awkward, like, I'm going to get back with you. I'm going to get you this week. Um, but we want you to lean in over the next four weeks for this series called Missed Calls. Uh, we're going to be talking about the ways in which we sometimes miss the opportunities of God. Sometimes we miss God taking us into a new chapter of potential or purpose. Maybe God is calling you out of your comfort zone and we just sometimes miss the call. But today in particular, before we start talking about missing the call of potential and missing the call of opportunity and missing the call of fruitfulness and missing the call of doing more, we're going to talk about a call that I think we often ignore and really we often ignore it because of insecurity. Sometimes we ignore it because we just don't feel strength in this particular way. We're going to talk about what happens when we're so married to our preferences, so married to our comforts, that we miss the call of witness and evangelism. What happens when God is calling and we're ignoring to be his witnesses? And so it's with this in mind that we're going to go into the first week of this series. I want to take your attention to the words of Jesus found in the book of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is teaching and he begins talking to his disciples about what it looks like to be a Christian, to be a believer. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are also the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot or watch it should not be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the community, in the house, in the same way. So, so Jesus has used these metaphors of salt and light to help describe to us what should a Christian or a believer's life look like to the world around us? He says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine. Okay, let your good behavior, let your attitude, let your work ethic, let your kindness, let your forgiveness, let something about the way you live shine out for all to see. So that everyone will praise, not you, not me, but our heavenly Father. I want to preach from this thought today. If you're a note taker, pray that you are. I want to preach from this thought today. Can I get a witness? Got no amens and a half a clap. I ain't scared of y'all. I'm going to look at you again. Uh, 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 I'm just wondering today, can I get a witness? Let us pray. Oh, amen. Oh, pity clap. Come on. Wow. Let us pray. Father, we pray now. That they not hear my voice or see my face, but only hear and see the voice and face of you that lives in me. I decrease as you increase. We pray that you would have your way in these, your services, your experience. Our ears are open. Our hearts are ready. In Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Can I get a witness? I'm going to just start off. Can we just talk today? Can we start off just talking? Look at your neighbor and say, we're just going to talk. 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 I just want to start off just just talking. You know, it, it, it's very interesting I, I, as I begin to think about today's sermon, I'm reminded of uh, the, the initial journeys of my childhood and learning about my faith and 
And, uh, and there's this little song that we used to sing. Now, I need y'all help. Don't leave me out here by myself. Look, I need y'all help. Don't try to act like you don't know it. Pick whatever note you want. We're not going to judge your vocal acumen today, okay? But just help me out a little bit. We all used to sing this song when we were a kid. Uh, uh, this little light of mine. Come on. I'm going to let it shine. Come on, pick whatever note you want. Come on. This little light of mine. Oh, I'm going to let it Y'all sound real good. One more again. This little light of mine. Yes, Lord. I'm going to let it shine. Three for harmony. Let it shine. Mm. Let it shine. Ooh. Let it shine. All right, amen. Some of y'all was in the youth choir. Some of y'all won't. Come on, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> what a beautiful song to sing. What a complicated thing to live. I'm going to say it again. What, what a beautiful song to sing. Th this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But what a complex thing to live. Like when we start trying to live a life and a light that can shine, it requires some intentionality. It requires some different practices. And, and very often we are asking ourselves, uh, this sounds good, but how do I do this? Very often I have come to find, and maybe you have as well, that one of the easiest and one of the uh, most effective ways to let my light shine is at the table. Somebody say at the table. Yeah, yeah, the table is such a beautiful place. The table uh, is a place of human connection in all of our lives. The table is the place where family and friends can show up. The table is the place where messiness and ministry emerges. The table is the place where deliverance and discipleship shows up. The table is the place where, where, where victory shows up, but also we help people through bondage. The, the table is the place where we offer forgiveness, but we also have honest and hard conversations. Okay, here it is. The table is the place where your crazy aunt and your real saved uncle can come and sit at the same place. Oh, that's just my family. Y'all just know that's just me. The table is the place where your cousin who doesn't know about God and, and, and your, your friend who always talks about God can eat the same meal. It all happens at the it is then with this in mind that we shouldn't be surprised that very often Jesus throughout Scripture uses the table as a way to impact people's lives. Throughout Scripture, we see it both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see this theme showing up over and over again. Jesus invites people to the table for conversation and development and hard dialogue. And not only did it start in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament, the table was a place where they reflected and remembered the goodness of God. In the Old Testament, there were five feasts that were designed for community and commemoration. The table is central to our faith. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright even writes this. He says, when Jesus seeks to describe his death, burial, and resurrection to his disciples, he doesn't preach a sermon. Look at what it says. It says, when Jesus wanted to explain this, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. That the communion we just took is a remembrance that Jesus put together a supper so that he could prepare his disciples for his death, burial, and resurrection. The table throughout the Bible is the place where people come so that they can grow, so they can learn, so they can become all that God has called them to be. It's for this reason, Ralph, I I've made up in my mind, it's for this reason, that I am convinced that food is one of God's love languages. I wish I had a few amen amens right there. I, I, I was excited about that. When I got that revelation, I said, me and God are really alike. I know you're saying, Vernon, Vernon, where did you get that from? Did you know that the average human is created with 10,000 taste buds? 10,000 taste buds would suggest to me that by design, God wanted me to enjoy food. He cared deeply about my dining experiences. It's for this reason as well, Quita, that I think it is so tragic when somebody works hard to prepare a good meal, but it's not seasoned well. I'm not making no eye contact with nobody. I'm not trying to get in trouble today. I'm just saying every now and then you can show up to a plate that it wasn't about the ethic that it took to make it. 
It's just that it won't season the way you like. And hear me, it doesn't matter what you make. If you don't season it well, I don't want it. Come on, can I get five amens and a clap? Amen. I don't want it. And I wonder today, as believers and as Christians, if people are saying the same thing about our faith. That we're not just presenting plates, but we're presenting lives. That people are saying the lights look good and, 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 and the, the parking was great and the experience was awesome and, and, and the songs were good. But, but, but when I got underneath the surface, I recognized that, that what looked good on the plate, what was presented wasn't seasoned with grace. And seasoned with love and seasoned with humility and seasoned with joy. Are we seasoned well? Because it doesn't matter what we know if people don't want to consume what we have. It's for this reason I think that Jesus uses this illustration. He says, you are called to be the salt of the earth. Salt, in this day and time, you need to understand, was used for two primary purposes. Salt was first used as a preservative. It was used because there was no system of refrigeration. And so salt helped preserve whatever they were eating. But not only was it used as a preservative, it was also used as an enhancer of flavor. Thank God we still use it for that today. And so the reality of it is, whenever you begin to look at this, you see over and over again that Jesus is using this illustration to help us to understand that our lives shouldn't not be a hindrance to an environment, but a help. I'm going to say it again. That our lives should not be problematic to people, but should be encouraging to people. That when we show up, healing should show up. That when we show up, help should show up. That when we show up, the environment should be enhanced. Not to, that, that something should shift when the salt shows up. Look at your neighbor and say, are you salty? Are you, are you, are you salty? Now, now, this sounds really good, but, but here's the problem. Can I tell you the problem? I think part of the problem in Western Christianity is that if many of us be honest, we have bought into consumerism Christianity. What are you talking about, Vernon? That we have bought into a faith system that is built on getting more gifts from God, but not responding to his best gift. And saying, I love this gift of salvation and grace and mercy so much that I don't just want to receive it, I want to give it. Yeah. That, that, that it is not just supposed to be I became in relationship with Jesus so that he can keep giving. But it's also about I'm in relationship with Jesus so I can help people get something that I got. That we are called to be a witness. And I told Sierra before the sermon, I knew this ain't going to be your favorite sermon. This ain't going to be the one you want to replay. This ain't going to be the one you share with your friends. But I'm here to tell you today that we're all called to be a witness. There are two types of people in this room. Two types of people in this room. I'm committed. Two types of people in this room. There's one person in this room that um, whenever your phone rings, you got to pick it up. I mean, you get anxiety. You're like, oh, my God, I got to pick up my phone. My phone, my phone rings. My phone rings. I got to pick up my phone. I got to pick up my phone. Pick up my phone. And then there's another type of person. You pick up your phone only if you know the number. Come on, I'm just looking for a few honest people. You're like, I ain't got time to be picking up stuff I don't know. I don't, I gotta, you need to leave a voicemail, and then I will find out if I'm available based on who was calling. And, uh, and, and recently I had an experience with this because... Uh, uh, as many of you know, we took a sabbatical in the summer, and we went to a lake house with the family, and, and uh, we were in this lake house, and I'll never forget, we were, we were going out because on the back of the lake, they had kayaks, and so each day, we were going out on these kayaks. It was a wonderful experience. I, I got real confident. I had went out, by, uh, Pastor Ashley and I, uh, in another experience earlier in the year, and so I felt real comfortable taking other people out on the water, so I took my kids out, and I went each and every day, and, and each day, uh, Rob, I got more comfortable. I got more confident. First day, I strapped in tight, and I took my phone, and I put it in a plastic bag, and I stuck it in and made sure that nothing was out of place to make sure that everybody was safe on the water. It was great. Then the next day I started to get a little more comfortable and the next day and then the day before we were about to leave, I was like, I got this. So I didn't strap up 
my harness or my vest. I, I, I just kind of said, we'd be all right. I didn't put my phone in, in a bag. And, and so me and Pastor Curtis were out on the water, and then everything went smooth. And then we got back. And, and then because I was so comfortable with us, but because I was not paying attention to the details, uh, we got out of the kayak, and my phone fell into the lake. My iPhone. <laughs> What's going Pastor Curtis is a real one. He's a real one. It's my brother right there. He was about to jump in after the phone. I mean, full dive, Olympic. He was like, let's get it. I was like, not necessary, not necessary. We'll just go to the store. So it took a couple days. I just was texting people from my iPad and eventually went to the store. I got a new phone. Got a new phone. But, but, but very shortly after that, I received a call. And I ignored the call, not knowing it was somebody I've known for years. Why did I ignore the call? I'm glad you asked. Because while I got a new phone, I did not maintain and transfer the connection into this new season. And for a lot of us, what happens is God is progressing us. But as we move forward, we are forgetting to sustain the connection that got us here in the first place. And so now when he calls, we don't pick up the way we used to because we say, but I got something new. I got a new thing. And I got a new season and I got a new job and I got a new boo. But what happens when you get the new thing, but you didn't sustain the right connection? And, 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 and I didn't transfer my connections. So here I am with a new phone, but I'm ignoring the call of somebody who's trusted, who's reliable. And here's what I've come to believe. I believe that, 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 that we have some of the numbers we need in our phone. And our, like we have God's call. Come on, somebody say God call. That's a fear call. You know, you, you grew up like me. It was like, you better pick up God call, God call, and you better stop playing with God, you know, strike you down. So, so that's an honor call. Like we're going to pick up God's call. Like he's great and he's mighty and he's strong. And then we got Jesus' call. We all love that one. It's full of grace, mercy, love and kindness toward us. <laughs> like, well, I pick up Jesus' call. Jesus' call makes me feel good. Jesus gives. But I wonder today, are we picking up the call of Jesus and the call of God? But do you have the Holy Spirit's number saved? Because very often, while Jesus' call is one of grace and God's one is call of honor or fear, holy fear, uh, the Holy Spirit's call is often one of responsibility. Often, the Holy Spirit's call is one of courage. Often, on the other side of that call, there will be an ask. There will be a shift. There will be something you have to do. And a lot of us are good picking up calls as long as we're going to get. But do you pick up the call that's going to ask you to do? Yeah. question I think God is asking is, can I still get? witness. I, I, I'm not making this up. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is the call of all of us. Look at what the Bible says. But you will receive power when what? The Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be mine. Let's say it together. Witnesses. Kind of quiet in the room. We're going to say it one more time. And you will be my. I'm going to wake your neighbor up one more time. And you will be my. Witnesses. Now, he doesn't say the pastor will be my witnesses. And the worship leaders will be my witnesses. And, and, okay, and the ministers and elders will be my witnesses. No, 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 he says, he says, all y'all will be my witnesses. That when we start answering the Holy Spirit's call, when we start sensing that conviction on the inside of us, when, when we start feeling that prompting to have a conversation with the person in the office that nobody talks to, when we start looking at that child at the bus stop and say, that's more than just another child standing next to my kid, that's an assignment. When we start to sense, Holy Spirit is calling me, we'll start to be his witnesses. Well, Jesus, of course, I love, he doesn't just ask us to do something ambiguously. He models this for us. Like he shows us a way to be witnesses. Can I read another scripture? Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to read a little Bible today. Is that all right with y'all? I said, can we read a little Bible? Is that all right with y'all? Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Look at what happens. Jesus has found himself being a witness. He comes to this moment in time. And it says, while Jesus was having dinner table at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. Why? Just for there were many who followed him. Let's pause there. That means... Jesus didn't just have churchy people following him. Okay, I'm going to mess with some of y'all theology real quick. Because you thought the only people who were supposed to be in your camp are people who all think like you. 
But if you are really going to be a follower of Jesus at some point, when you are ready in your maturation, there should be somebody following you who doesn't know the same stuff as you. He's eating with these people, tax collectors, the sinners, and everyone. And it says, when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with these types of people, what are he doing eating with them? He says, he says, they asked, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I need you to hear me today because often, again, we've been talking about this word since June's Bible study, this word of sin and sinners and the way sin shows up in all of our lives. That when we see the word sin in Scripture, very often it is coming from a derivative of the Hebrew or Aramaic word kata, which means failure to miss the mark or to miss the goal. What is Jesus trying to get us to understand here? That he was very often engaged with people who he was helping to see where sin might be showing up in their life. And here's what I'm trying to help you to understand. Understand today, we all need Jesus to help us see some of our sin because each and every one of us has some areas and some places where we're missing the mark. That means Jesus is not just after a Christianity that is good at Sunday service, but he's after a Christianity that is good with Wednesday wor word and conversation, that he's after your daily devotion, that he's after your eating habits, that he's after your spending habits, that he's after your relationships, that he's after your dating, that he's after your work ethic, that he's after every part of your because all of it, watch this, testifies. All of it testifies. And what he's saying to us over and over again is, can I get a witness? And very often, here it is, I think we confuse the role of the table and the role of the temple. We, we, we're going to be good. Some of us are going to be like, all right, if I just get people to church, somebody say temple. That's beautiful. But that is not the end of discipleship. That's the beginning of it. That the temple is here to be a welcoming place, to be a loving place, to be a place that introduces people to the truth that can change their life. But we have to be careful not to depend on the temple for the work of the table. That after they show up next week, they're still going to need to ask some questions somewhere. That after they show up and experience worship, they're still going to have some questions about the word. That after they show up and experience the song, they're still going to need somebody to say, can you walk with me? Can you talk with me? That I love the temple, but I need a table if I'm going to grow. This is why we all have to own our role as witnesses. Because no matter how many people we invite to the temple, if we can't get them to a table at a life group, we can't get them to a table in growth track, we can't get them to a table, somebody who wants to see them beyond the service, we will not be able to see them mature into all that God has called them to be. It's for this reason that one of our values here as a church is that we throw family functions because we want to try to make as many people feel comfortable at the table. That we can. And my hope for us as a church is that we won't miss the call. While we're pursuing the call of God for our future and pursuing the call of God for our finances and pursuing the call of God for our platforms, may we not miss the call to be a witness. Because that's a call as well. I don't know about anybody else, but I grew up in a church, and my mom was here at the first service, she testified to this truth that um, she would, she would often take us, and I grew up Pentecostal. Any Pentecostal people in here? Where y'all at? Come on here. Holler at me. Okay. Amen. 12, 12 of us. We can't get in no fight. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and so, and so uh, very often, uh, she would take us to the mall. She was our youth leader, and her and some of the leaders from our church would get me and some of my homies, and we would go to the mall. And she would do this thing with us. Maybe some of y'all know what I'm talking about. She would put this pamphlet in our hand. At the mall. I'm going to say it again. Y'all, she took me to the mall. I'm like 12, 13, 14. I'm starting to feel myself now. I'm like, all right, here we go. And she would put this pamphlet in her hands called a track. Anybody remember this? And she would put this in her hand and say, now I want y'all to walk around the mall. 
the place where I'm starting to like girls, the mall. The place where I'm going to see my friends, the mall. She would say, I want y'all to go around and I want y'all to hand this out to people so that they could come to know Jesus. And so we'd be like, yes, ma'am. Because I grew up with manners. Don't try to look at me like that. I want disobedient, y'all. Some of y'all need to, you know. And then we would walk around the corner. And then we'd take them tracks and we'd put them on the <laughs> We'd be like, bro, I ain't about to walk around this mall. And I just saw my crush. I got to go get my lines together. What you talking about? And you know, what's interesting is, I felt the conviction the other day that, man, they knew something about what it meant not to lose your witness. That they knew something about what it meant to be bold with your faith. Here it is. And one of the things that we talked about at Dream Team Sunday last Sunday with all of our Dream Team is that we've become very comfortable in the body of Christ, fishing in aquariums, but not the sea. Yeah, yeah. Jesus says we're called to be fishermen of men. That means we're called to reach people who are far from God, afraid from God, afraid of the church, lost. We are called to go fish. But what we've done is say, I'll cast my line in other churches. And I'll say we save people at the conference that we all was at. And all we do is conference hop and revival hop and church hop. And so we fish in the aquarium. But I'm just looking for a few people who said it's time for us to take our line and take it out to the sea. That there is a world that needs to know about Jesus. And we cannot get comfortable fishing in aquariums when there's so many more people to reach outside of them. So with this in mind, and I think that the scripture reminds us over and over again of four ways to witness. Real quick, four ways to witness. I'm going to walk through these. I'm going to walk through these. We're going to look at some scripture for most of these. Because I want us to understand that each and every one of us is called to be his witnesses. Here's number one. Here's number one. First thing we have to know if we're going to be an effective witness is we have to know we witness with our words. Ooh, somebody say my words. Come on, say it loud and say my words. Oh, man, y'all ain't going to like this one. Let, let's get some scripture. Uh, Proverbs 12 and 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. When is the last time your words have healed somebody? Do your words heal or do they hinder? Okay, okay, y'all ain't like that one. Proverbs 15 and 4. Y'all ain't going to like this one even more. A gentle tongue. We can stop right there. Some of you are like, okay, I'm good with like him using me, but I'm going to say it the way I say it. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness, it breaks the spirit. Meaning God said it's not just about what you say, but it's about how. Okay, okay, okay. Y'all mad. Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4. Look at what it says. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen that I have an assignment to use my words to be a witness. Okay, last one. James 1 and 26. Y'all really not going to like this one. Tap your neighbor. Say, you ain't going to like this one. If you claim to be religious, but can't even control your tongue. You ain't fooling nobody else. <laughs> you fooling yourself. It's important that we understand this because watch it. Nobody cares about your life if they can't talk to you. Okay, nobody said amen over here. I'm gonna just talk. I got a few amens over here. Nobody cares about your life if they can't have a conversation with you. Okay, can I make it plain? We just started school. Okay, school just started. I don't care how many degrees you got as a teacher. If you don't know how to talk to my kids. You better watch it. The tone. The tone. When you start doing this. Start adjusting for no reason. You be like, no, wait, no. No. Have you ever, have you ever thought somebody was cute? Until you started talking to him. <laughs> I got a lot of amens right there. Like you was like, I'm going to just go see what they're talking about. <laughs> they started talking, you'd be like, <laughs> no, I was, no, I was just wondering if you knew your way around here. <laughs> Trying to, yeah, no, nah, we're not from here. It's cool. <laughs> what? 
Because what comes out of our mouth matters. And we keep saying, how do I be a better witness? One, with your words. Here's number two. We are witnesses with our ways. One of the things we often say to the dream team here is that people first will follow how you behave before they follow what you believe. Do you behave in a way that I will be attracted to your life? Do you behave in a way that I'll be attracted to your marriage? Do you behave in a way that I'll be attracted to your habits? Do you have ways that reflect God? This is why in Galatians 5, Paul says this in verse 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. In other words, he's saying there are behaviors that should follow believers. Like, there are behaviors that should show up once the Holy Spirit takes root in your heart. Why? Because a changed life is the most powerful witness you will carry. So if you, you want people to believe in what you believe in, but they can't believe in your behavior. You're saying this faith will help you, but I ain't seen a harvest in you. And there should be some ways that emerge in us that allow people to be attracted to this gospel that we carry. I love what Francis Assisi is, St. Francis Assisi, he says we must preach the gospel at all times when necessary. Use words. Yeah. We must preach the gospel at all times when necessary. Use words. Could it be that your walk is going to be a greater witness than your preaching in this season? That you've been trying to preach people into coming home. But what if you just walked people into coming home? They said, I don't know what it is about you, but the way you live, the way you walk, your ways are so attractive that I got to know what must I do to be saved. We witness with our words. We witness with our ways. Here's the third one. Are you ready for this one? We witness with our worship. Now, I know some of y'all was like, he just needed another W. It ain't do. This preacher, this how they do. He was like, what's another W? What's another W? No, 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 no. We, we actually do witness with our worship. Why? Because worship is a reflection of our source. This is why in 1 Samuel 30, we see David. And David has hit a rough patch. His family is gone. They've been kidnapped. They've been taken hostage. His wife, his kids, his town has been burned down called Ziklag. He finds himself in a situation where everything has been lost. And the people that should have his back have abandoned him. They're talking about stoning him. And the Bible says he encourages himself in the Lord. That he gets his devotion. That he gets his ephod. That he goes to God in worship. And something happens. He walks away from that ready for battle. That when he worshiped, he found a strength that he couldn't get from people. That when he worshiped, he found a confidence that he couldn't get from people. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that one of the things that your worship does, amongst two things, is the first thing it does is it allows for people to be attracted to your source. Had a situation happen recently. Um, I was trying to get a pair of shoes, and, uh, and, and one of the guys who goes to this church, his name is Pete, he's a barber, and uh, he serves on a security team. Pete, uh, and I told Pete, hey, it's Pete right there. That makes noise for Pete. That's my guy right there. Pete, make, God bless you, Pete. And uh, so, so Pete was cutting my hair, and I was like, Pete, um, man, I'm trying to get these shoes. And he was like, say less, bro, I got you. I, you know, I, I, I find stuff. And so I said, cool, Pete. And, and some weeks it went by. And then I was in Mexico with my wife on vacation, and then Pete texted me and, with a link and was like, I got him. Click the link, you're good. I said, but, 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 Pete, how you, how you got them? Because can't nobody get them. <laughs> now, now, for those of you in the shoe game, we call this the plug. <laughs> for those of you who are not up to date on this particular vernacular, the plug is an individual who can get access to things that other people cannot make readily available. It means that while online said it wasn't accessible, Pete says, I know how to gain access 
because I know how to get to the source. I'm trying to help somebody understand today that why you need to worship is because it reminds people that when everything else is going crazy, I got a different source. I don't care who's in the White House, I got a different source. I don't care who wins the election, I got a different source. I don't care what they're doing at the job, I got a different source. They laying people off, that's all right. My source comes from him. I know that he can give jobs, he can give resources, he can open up a door that no man can shut. I know that everybody's losing their mind, but I got a different source. And when you have a different source, you can lift your hand when life is going crazy. You can sing the song when you don't see it changing. You can make sure that you say, God, if I live and for God, I die because my source is different. And here's what I've come to find. People will be drawn to a life that has a different source. They'll say, they'll say, everybody's losing their minds. Why do you have peace? Because I got a different source. Did, did, did you see the email that went out? Did you, did you see the text message? Did you, did you see what happened in the group? That I did. So why are you not mad and cussing everybody out? Because I got a different source. I, I know that they might have let me down, but God won't. I know that they might have left, but God's still here. I know who my source is. And worship draws people to our source. Here's the other thing. It draws people to our story. When people see you worship, they are curious. What in the world has happened in your life that you trust them the way you do? This is why the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that we don't just overcome by the blood of the lamb, but the word of our, that part of testimony is our worship, that we are drawing people into our story so we can point to the story. Can I tell y'all a quick story? I'm going to give y'all this last point, and I'm going to get out of your way. I know it's Labor Day weekend. You ready to grill out one last time? Come on here. This is the last grill week, right? The last grill weekend right here. You got to put on your good shoes, your Crocs, and <laughs> lotion the heels, and let's get to it. I'm sorry. Too far, too far, too far. Um, I'm going to tell you the whole story. Uh, some of you follow us on social media. You should be following us on social media. If you're not following us on social media, shame on you. Um, <laughs> the Life Church RBA. Um, and uh, and uh, so you would have known that, that week before last, uh, we officially closed on our new location, TLC North. Come on here. God is faithful. Now, 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 here's what's crazy. I love social media, but social media just don't got enough characters to tell the whole story. So can I just take a moment? I want you to understand that while we have been praying and celebrating in partnership with our board of trustees who make sure we're fiduciary, uh, fiduciary responsibility, make sure we're being wise in our stewardship and our board of elders and ministers who are praying and undergirding us through this process, things were going smooth. Things were going according to plan. Uh, we had already talked to the bank. We had already talked to the sellers. We were like, man, this is going great. And then 30 days before closing, our bank called us, the bank we had partnered with in the past, a bank that we never missed a payment for, a bank that we had never done anything to damage the relationship. They called and said, even after giving us a letter of commitment, they said, unfortunately, we're taking a different position on churches. And so we're pulling out of the deal. 30 days before closing, we did not have a bank to support the deal. We begin to pray. We begin to come together. We say, hey, well, well, we know we can't do this with the cash on hand, and, and that would be unwise, and so we need to just continue conversations. So we begin to engage different banks, and if you know anything about commercial real estate, you just can't close a deal in two weeks. You don't just walk into the bank and be like, hey, can you give us some money? Give me my money. <laughs> my wife is giving me the look like, no more. Don't try to be relevant. No more. She know which one I want to say. I'm just trying to be very mindful, very dumb we are. Woo! So sorry. My wife is so disappointed. She's like, I told you not to go there and embarrass me like that. No, 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 no. So... I love this church. I promise you I do. <laughs> so, so, so 30 days out, no bank. We start calling 
multiple banks, and, and there were many banks who wanted to work with us, but here's what they were saying. They were saying, hey, the down payment you would need for this property, I just want to be abundantly clear, would at minimum be a million plus. And our board was just like, hey, we just don't feel comfortable with that type of investment. I mean, we just want to make sure that we're making a wise decision with the resources of the house, and so we got to keep working on a different deal. One bank would say, nope, this one got to be. Another bank said, this one got to be. We went through six banks. Two things happened. Can I tell you miracle one? Miracle one, at this point, we knew we would not be able to close at the time that we had agreed to on contract. So we went to the sellers, pastor in this city, and Pastor Curtis and I went to lunch with him about a month before, and so we saw them at a softball game and pulled them to the side and said, sir, uh, we just want to be upfront with you about what's happening. Uh, the bank pulled out of this deal, uh, but we really believe that God has called us to this mission and to this moment. And he said something to us. We said, can we just get an extension? And he looked at Pastor Curtis us, uh, and me, me in the eye, and he said, don't you bring this up again. He said, I want you to know we got people calling us and offers waiting for y'all not to close this deal, and we got things going on. But let me be abundantly clear, this is not about the money. This is about the mission continuing. And I don't care how long it takes y'all, this building is y'all's. We prayed. And so we're going to wait for whatever needs to happen for y'all to walk into acquisition of this property. I need somebody to understand that's a miracle, that they could have ran after the money, that they could have left us by the wayside. And they said, no, 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 no. We prayed. This belongs to y'all. Y'all are going to carry this mission forward. This building is waiting on y'all. I just felt the Lord say to somebody, your miracle is waiting on you. Whatever you've been praying about, you ain't got to worry if it's still going to be there. It's waiting on you. I dare somebody to give God a 30-second praise because what you've been praying for ain't going to miss you. Yes, the Lord. It's waiting on me. I found somebody say, it's waiting on me. But then they said, we'll wait, but we still needed a bank. Then we passed curse. Went to one bank. They said, nah, I can't do it. One, two bank. Nah, I can't do it. Three bank. Nah, I can't do it. Four bank. Y'all, we was at the six bank. Not only did they present us an offer to get the property, but the offer allowed for us to pay off Bryce. And close by giving only half of what the other banks asked for. I came to let somebody know that God ain't failed you and he ain't gonna start now. I dare somebody to give a praise because he's just that I don't know who needs to hear this, but he's an on time God. He's never lost a battle and he never will. So I dare you to give him 30 seconds to say, God, you're still worthy. God, you're still mighty. God, you're still strong. God, you're still awesome. God was with us the whole time. And we didn't know what he was doing. But when we worship, we don't just carry uh, uh, this disservice. We carry a story. So can I just tell y'all something? When we get over there at Deal Road and people ask him, why y'all jumping like that? And why y'all shouting like that? And why y'all spinning like that? You just need to look at somebody. Baby, this is a cardio. I'm carrying a story of God's goodness. I ain't just here to exercise. I'm here to give him what he's due. I ain't just here to show up for activity. I'm here because I found that he shows up. Even when others say no, God says yes. That's my story. That's your story. That's our story. When we worship, we draw people to the story. And as a church, I want us to carry the story because I want people to know we're not just passionate for exercise. We're passionate because we know that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, there are no buildings. We worship because it's a reflection of the story. witness when we worship. We witness with our words and our ways. Can I say this last one? I'm done. And we witness with our welcome. Like, like, I'm excited for what the Lord is doing in this church. And I could have stopped there. But it's all for naught if we think that God did it for us to sit in rooms 
with each other. That God didn't do it just so that we would have a good time in a new space. He did it because he's trusting us to be witnesses, to fill the space with people who need to know the truth of God's word. Prove it to you. I want to really quickly show you this in scripture. It's a familiar story. Prodigal son. Some of you know it. But for those who don't, really quick, we can have a seat. I'm done. The Bible says that Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples, his children, sons and daughters, you and I, what it looks like to be in the kingdom. And he says there were two sons. These sons represent each and every one of us. One son said, hey, dad, I love you. I appreciate you, but I want to take everything you have for me. I want it now. He takes his inheritance and he runs off into the world. And the Bible says that he spends everything he has and that he lives wildly. And he finds himself in the worst possible condition. So much so that he's in a pig's pen. The Bible says he came to himself and said, things are better with my father. And so the Bible says he begins to go home. And while on his way, the Bible even goes on to say, from afar, not, not when he got in the seat, but from the parking lot, not, 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 not when the service and the sermon started, but, but, but from the time they walked across the bridge, it said his father saw him and began to welcome him on, hey! Come on. In verse 22, it says, father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast, table, celebrate. For his son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now in his fine. So they began to celebrate. But meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He was like, oh, let me follow this party. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said hey, man, what, what, what are we celebrating? So your brother has come. He replied, and your father killed the fattened calf, which was a prestigious honor because he's back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So, so his father went out and pleaded with him. He said, he said, son, why you won't come in? He said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed you. Yet you gave me even, you never even gave me a goat to celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your stuff, lived not like you, who, who walked away from you. When that child came home, you did all of this. He said, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Very often, we can see ourselves in the story as the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter. We can see and remember where we were when we came to ourselves. and said, man, I got to, I got to go home, man. That, 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 that God has more for my life. But today what I want to caution you on is what happens when you're the older son and daughter? What happens when next week that these seats are so filled with people who might be afraid to come home and you are willing to give up your seat so they can. What happens when you have to sacrifice your convenience so that somebody can park closer than you so you can take the walk? Because hear me, next Sunday is not for you. It's for our witness. Here's what I come to find lastly. That every church is a table. And there are always four seats at the table. Today, we know the seat of the preacher and the teacher and the worship leader, the people who are on platform. They're always at the table. They, they, they're here to serve and to educate and to inform and to empower. It's beautiful. It's a seat that I hold and many in this church hold. And then there's the seat of the mature believer. Those of us who say, I've walked with God and I know God and I've been giving and I've been serving. I've been loving people and I'm doing all the things. 
I loved all the songs we sung today, and I'm mature. But very often we forget there are also new believers at the table. People will say, I'm happy y'all let me come in, but just because I enjoyed the song doesn't mean I understand the scriptures. Just because I had a good time doesn't mean I know how to get closer to him when I'm by myself. And you keep saying, come on in and go home and come on in and go home, but, but I'm going to need something different from the table if I'm going to grow. And that's why we do starting point for those starting, seeking and returning to their faith so they can grow in the foundation. That's why we do pursuing purpose so they can say, hey, God didn't just have you on this earth by accident, but there's something he placed inside of you. This is why we do free life so they can say, I once was bound, but now I'm found in him because I'm new to this thing. And I want to be better, but I need some help. You got teachers and leaders and shepherds and singers and mature believers and new believers. And the one I think the church is often given up on is the unbeliever. There are people who will come to the table next week who don't even believe what we believe. They're going to say, I'm here because my friend invited me. I'm here because my neighbor said come. I'm here because my coworker is really nice. And I guess I'll just, I'll show up for you. My family's in town and might as well just pull up. And the question I just want to ask us today is do we only care about these tea seats at the table? Or do we care to make space at the table for everybody? I believe that God is asking all of us the question he's been saying generation after generation. Can I get a witness? Somebody who's willing to say, yeah, I might lose some reputation. I might, I might have some people who, who, who are a little odd about, awkward around me now. And I, might, I might not be able to, to go to the same places or do the same things, but I want to be known as somebody who created space at the table everybody to know the truth that God loves them and can change their life. Can we be his witnesses? Would you stand on your feet all across this room? Really quickly, I just want to invite you to consider your own convictions in this moment. I don't know what God is putting on your heart who he's calling you to witness to, who he's calling you to invite to church next weekend, who he's calling you to pursue, what ways in which he's saying, hey, how are your behaviors and ways or your words aligning with my witness? And I want you to know this. God loves you deeply. And what gift he's given to us, we get the opportunity to share with others. So let's pray. Father, I pray now that somebody in this room Somebody online will be charged and challenged to share what they know. That you are a good God, worthy of all praise. God, as we leave this place today, may we leave motivated to be your witnesses. May our words and our ways and our worship, may our welcome next weekend shift and shape lives forever. No, no, God, there may be somebody in this room who needs to receive you as their Lord and Savior. Maybe they're saying, hey, I came today and I don't need to wait on next weekend. I need Jesus to be my Savior. What I've experienced today has changed my life. I came to let you know this today. God doesn't care about what you did last year, last week, last night. He loves you and he desires relationship with you. So right now, if you want to give your life to Christ, or maybe rededicate your life to Christ. I was in a relationship with God, but if I'm being honest, I put a whole bunch of other things in front of him. But I want to realign. I want to give him my life for the first time. On the count of three, I just want you to lift that hand in the air. I'm not going to ask you to say anything. We just want heaven to see as you make a bold declaration. Today, I'm forever changed. Nobody's going to ask you to say anything. Lift that hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Lift that hand. We see you all over this house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hands are going up all over. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, because you're family, we're going to pray together. And you don't have to pray alone. So let us say together, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins and getting up for my freedom. I decide to give you my life. From this day forward, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching this message here at The Life Church. We pray that it continues to encourage you. Now, we exist to impact culture through the innovative presentation of Christianity, and we want to inspire the people to live a better life. If you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text your dollar amount to 84321 or visit our website. Now, be sure to leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe, and even check out our other content as well. And don't forget, join us every Sunday online or in person. See you next time. God bless.